Hello to my colleagues in Hamilton, Ontario. I'm sorry I'm not able to be there with you this afternoon, but uh, I hope this will be something of a substitute and that I hope there'll be some discussion after uh, I read the paper. I'm going to read today a chapter that from a forthcoming book of mine entitled Psyche and Soul, and the chapter's name is Psychoanalysis and the Possibility of Meaning. I'll ask John Mills also to uh, give you guys my email in case you have any comments and you'd like to share them with me, they'd be very appreciated. So let me get to the text. <clears throat> Psychoanalysis and the Possibility of Meaning. Since metaphors evoke a multitude of responses, it is rare, if ever possible, for an author to know the full meaning of his or her work. This is certainly the case with Freud's creation of psychoanalysis. Its riches, richness is abundantly evident. His corpus is continually plumbed for insights. Whenever analysts or readers forget, however, that psychoanalysis is a creation and not a discovery, and that metaphors are its scaffolding, its limitations also become evident. Freud believed, given his conceptual meta medicalization of psychoanalysis, that his new science discovered causes rather than uncovered possible or plausible reasons for psychological symptoms and or experiences. In view of Wittgenstein's subsequent critique of psychoanalysis, we understand that causes have to do with established empirical results. Reasons are needed to construct meanings. Despite Freud's propensity for fixed ideas, psychoanalysis makes no pretense to unchanging, abidable, abiding truth. Freud and his early followers created an interpretive humanistic discipline, not an empirical science, where causes could be hypothesized and then subsequently tested. Consequently, we have to be aware that psychoanalysis did not discover any new ontological realities. This is as true of Freud's topographical model, uh, conscious, pre-conscious, and unconscious, as we know, as it is of his structural model, id, ego, and superego. Patently, they are theoretical postulates. That means minimally that the unconscious, for example, is an interpretive construct. It was not discovered as King Tut's tomb or the mouth of the Nile was discovered. When an analyst suggests a cause for a particular action, symptom, or fantasy, he or she is proffering a reason, hopefully with as much circumstantial evidence as possible. Since, as we know, a hundred different analysts with a hundred different patients offer different and in many instances effective interpretations to similar phenomena, it cannot be the same phenomena, it is clear that each analyst is offering a putative reason. When a patient is able to use such experiences, he or she will weave them into an overall tapestry of personal meaning and thereby gain further psychical integration. That is, the ability to resolve anxiety by experiencing more personal autonomy. Of course, all of the above is well known, a hundred years after psychoanalysis began to take shape. The text of psychoanalysis encompasses not only an individual's psychological symptoms, not only offers a model for interpreting dreams, but attempts to analyze civilization itself in its achievements as well as its repressive aspects. Overall, it becomes evident that Freud offers a Weltanschauung while claiming that he had none. Freud's remark, for example, at the end of The Future of an Illusion, that the voice of the intellect will finally gain a hearing over illusion, reflects, in fact, a particular all-encompassing worldview. Since every system of thought reflects a particular Weltanschauung, the issue is whether or not a particular worldview is an open or closed system. 
uh, formulaic approaches are usually closed systems. They easily lend themselves to fundamentalist interpretations. It was against such closed systems of thought, exemplified for Freud by religion, that he railed. He interpreted them as a flight from reality. Notwithstanding his dismissal of religion, his insistence that sexuality was a universal causative complex for understanding psychoneurosis comes remarkably close to a closed system. That is what William James was alluding to when he characterized Freud as a man with fixed ideas. Yet psychoanalysis is ultimately an open system since it encourages alternative interpretations of experiences without punitive superego judgments. Whereas traditional religious teachings focus on an individual's free will and thus obedience to God-given dictates, Freud spoke of psychic determinism and of the ego's graduated awareness or autonomy. It was left to Edward Glover, Glover excuse me, however, to bridge this gap and to speak of freed will, thereby making explicit the very rationale or possibility of psychotherapy, as well as the non-coercive experience of spirituality. Freed will enables us, if we think about it, to, to give a rationale for why psychotherapy is effective, not free will. Free will is a theoretical postulate. With the work of Ian Sudi, Sandor Ferenczi, Fairburn, Michael Ballant, and particularly Donald Winnicott, psychoana psychoanalysts began to augment conflict resolution with the task of creating personal meaning. Creating meaning does not mean imposing overreaching, overarching significance to one's life. It is, rather, a further development of ego autonomy through personally and progressively experiencing ownership of one's life. Donald Winnicott speaks of a child's need to create the found world, which of course is equally applicable to adults. Eric Erickson speaks of the need to will the inevitable that has happened to us. Both are saying the same thing. An individual not only gains mastery by integrating unintegrated psychological experiences, but also by expanding one's personal meaning to encompass the utterly random experiences of life. If the unconscious is known and therefore created through interpretations, then what we identify as objective reality necessarily encompasses what we identify as an area of mystery in human experience. Let me read that sentence again. If the unconscious is known and therefore created through interpretations, then what we identify as objective reality necessarily encompasses what we identify as an area of mystery in human experience. That we human beings are, um, excuse me, that we human beings are capable of denial, of splitting, of repression, is obviously true. It is also true that in designating such phenomena, we are reading human experiences through the lens of, through, the, uh, through a literary lens. Phenomenology, as we know, has no need to postulate an unconscious in its reading of the text of human actions and defenses. Therefore, I think it more neutral, that is, less misleading, to speak of the unconscious as that area of personal reality we experience as mysterious. By the term mysterious, I mean an awareness of an ever-receding, yet simultaneously inviting horizon to one's knowledge. Mysterious does not entail a flight to an utterly transcendent other to the notion of God, a God who supplies truth and meaning to human experience. 
whereas our social identity is of its very nature relational. Our experience of personal mystery has to do with what we experience as our essential aloneness, our essential solitariness. Religion, as Alfred North Whitehead, uh, in Whitehead's unique definition, is, quote, what one does with one's solitariness, end quote. What we can speak of as spirituality arises out of our experience of personal mystery. Ultimately, however, spirituality is a way of being in the world, a way of living in the present, without getting trapped, so to speak, by the concreteness of our historical actuality. Within this context, we can speak of an everyday transcendence, to paraphrase the evocative work of James Grotstein, particularly uh, as you will read, for those of you who are familiar with it, in his book, Who is the Dreamer Who Dreams the Dream? Such a notion of an everyday transcendence can serve as a backdrop, so to speak, to the essential aloneness that both Whitehead and Winnicott speak of. An everyday transcendence, as I use the term, captures for me the awareness that we live in a world of infinite possibilities, from the micro to the macro level, a mist, a mist of infinite possibilities, to borrow an approach from quantum mechanics. The human enterprise is open-ended and constantly evolving. We have the capacity to create the found world we live in. Paradoxically, however, we are both limited and not limited by the concreteness, the historical actuality of our individual as well as our collective histories. Because we live in a world of infinite possibilities, the singularity of meaning, which we frequently designate as explanation, must in fact be understood within this context. Actually, a context of infinite possibilities makes any open system of thought possible. Notwithstanding its tendency for fixed ideas and its tendency to formalize the unconscious, psychoanalysis has brought an appreciation of multiple meanings, multiple explanations into full awareness. Of course, good literature has done the same. To repeat, the concept of an everyday or natural transcendence is meant to suggest a pervasive ground to our daily experience, out of which our creativity, our individuality, and our collectivity grows. Imagine, for a moment, each individual person as an echo, so to speak, of a fuller voice. One of the goals of therapy is to individualize and to give personal meaning to that voice. That fuller voice is an analogy for what we mean by an everyday transcendence. Our psychoanalytic lens must, of necessity, get wider if we live in a world of infinite possibilities. When we interpret, for example, what we call the unconscious, we interpret and in that sense create the world we live in. Thus, for example, we create a new personal history in psychoanalysis, as Andre Green reminds us, a history not of illusion, but of reconstructive interpretation. Paul Ricoeur was among the first philosophers of psychoanalysis to show that in analysis one has a rendezvous with meaning as well as with history. Spirituality, as I have indicated, is an alternate model for experiencing our essential aloneness, our open-endedness, the area of personal mystery, issuing, for example, in a more meaningful life. Meister Eckhart, the medieval philosopher, theologian, and mystic, 
spoke of the need to be just in our dealings, the need to be compassionate in our interactions. So when we're talking about spirituality, we're talking about concrete experiences, not mystical flights, uh, solitary mystical flights. Spirituality is another way of approaching the human condition, another lens to interpret experience, to find the hidden in the present, a hidden that opens the present. It is not inextricably tied to visions or trances or special Gnostic knowledge. Human beings are not deepened or expanded simply by the discovery of facts be they the facts of one's history, one's defenses, and or one's present life experiences. They are primarily motivated by a sense of and a capacity to create meaning that makes both themselves and the world they live in inviting as well as mysterious. Ultimately, as we know, meaning must be personalized. It must have emotional as well as cognitive resonance for an individual. Otherwise, it is simply a fact. Psychoanalysis, it bears repeating, is not an assimilation of facts. Where id was, ego will be. Of course. But we can add, to be humanly alive means that we create the world we live in. In trying to explain what I mean by creativity, we can, I would like to suggest, speak of each person as a transparent mirror. Permit the contradiction for a minute. Such an image, such an image suggests that each person not only allows the world to pass through them uh, and form who one is, quite obviously, but also and simultaneously to reflect back and to affect, to create one's surroundings in response to what one is, in, in, excuse me, in response to what when one is experiencing. When individuals look at a mirror, they see themselves as shaped by all that has happened to them. When the mirror is transparent, they are in contact with the world in which they live. They are a response. Actually, each human being is a point of reference for everything that has transpired in human history. That's the point I'm trying to make with the image of the mirror. Let me read that again. Actually, each human being is a point of reference for everything that has transpired in human history. We are not isolates unrelated to each other and or the world. We are not ice cubes unconnected to each other. We and the world we live in are all made of the same stuff. That's a basic premise. Okay? That's why, ultimately, the well analyst doesn't cure the sick patient. Both analyst and patient integrate themselves with each analysis that they experience. Conceptualizing such a universal similarity is admittedly difficult. What do we mean by the same stuff? If we picture for a moment human beings not simply living on the earth, but being the earth in its consciousness, perhaps being the cosmos itself in its awareness, then my use of such categories as mystery or everyday transcendence or spirituality becomes, hopefully, more comprehensible. In using such an image as the same stuff, I am not suggesting a regression to an early oceanic merger with Mother World. Rather, what I am trying to address is the inevitable narcissism that follows from experiencing consciousness as simply and necessarily singular. The image of human consciousness as the Earth's awareness is a variant, I believe, of the physicist John Wheeler's anthropic principle. John Wheeler, 
physicist at Princeton in his 90s and still going strong. Wheeler's thesis envisions the evolutionary emergence of humanity as central, that is, as causative, to the unfolding of the cosmos itself. If we can speak of the human psyche as somehow embodying or reflecting the Earth's consciousness, then we, can also, then we also have another approach to understanding what we mean by a natural or everyday transcendence as well as by the image of individuals as transparent mirrors. What I'm trying to do here, obviously, is overcome the bifurcation of subject and object without therefore promoting an unproductive merger. I don't, I'm not trying to uh, uh, advocate an unproductive merger, but it's expanding our sense of boundaries without uh, diluting our sense of boundaries. Such metaphorical images are precursors, I believe, to understanding why poetry, mystery, and awe have to inform psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic technique. The careful application of psychoanalytic technique is guaranteed, I would submit, by an analyst's appreciation of the role of poetry, mystery, and awe, by the awareness that any intervention or interpretation can be simultaneously both objective as well as relative. Such an approach can augment clinical vitality, which is the antithesis of obsessive compulsive ruminations. Such obsessive behavior all too easily issues in a ritualization of clinical technique and or for that matter, the stagnation of spiritual understanding. Uh, as far as I can see, and many of you may uh, experience this as well, there are too many books on clinical technique. Not enough books on uh, Freud's notion of listening to your own unconscious, letting yourself be surprised, or in Beyond's terms, coming into each session without memory or desire. Uh, and it feeds, rather than, rather than resolving the new clinician's anxiety, uh, over-focus on technique feeds the anxiety. A lived appreciation of, of the metaphorical nature of, of knowledge helps avoid the pitfalls of ritualization. A ritualization that can easily give birth to a repetitive figuring out. Paradoxically, we can say that in order to understand, of course, we have to figure things out. More to the point, however, is that the reality that is that reality, I'm sorry, more to the point, however, is the reality that in order to understand, we ultimately have to get past figuring out. In order to learn anything, we have to transcend it. We have to get beyond it. Otherwise, we cannot know it. Creating the found world, creating personal meaning, therefore, is always a look backward, so to speak. When it is a look forward, when we impose meaning, it is all too often formalistic dogma. This, I believe, was what Freud might have meant when he spoke of psychoanalysis as not having a Weltanschauung. Both patient and analyst look back to construct meaning. That is, meaning fits the patient, so to speak not the other way around. Just as analytic technique must fit the patient rather than the patient fitting the technique. Only when we transcend, only when we get past where we are, can we know where we have been. Which means, of course, that in the moment, we never know where we are. What does such an approach imply for psychoanalytic practice or for spiritual understanding? Minimally, it focuses on the element of and need for surprise in our experiences with both our world and ourselves. An analyst has to be able to tolerate surprise. Pers surprise at what he does, not just at what the patient does. 
personal meaning, which is a retrospective acceptance, as well as a reorganization of our experiences, allows for a not knowing in the present. It is the opposite of a dogmatic blueprint for life. Surprise is one of the rewards of creativity. What does not surprise us is ultimately boring. Surprise is one of the byproducts of metaphors. Since metaphors mold significance out of the dull clay of facts that surround us. Each individuated point of reference, that is, each human being, in all his or her intrapsychic and interpersonal complexity, has led many Western thinkers in their attempts to understand our human setting, to speak of a ground, a ground to what we experience as our human world. From the medieval Meister Eckhart, who spoke of the ground as the absolute unnameable, to the modern German philosopher Martin Heidegger, who spoke of the presencing of being, the presencing of being, as well as to Freud, who reads the unconscious as ground enough. We have reason to posit that there is more to our knowledge than we can grasp. Such is the area I have spoken of as mystery. Such is what unconscious means, which the phrase everyday transcendence points to. The echo that we personalize, or we could also say, is personalized through us. Ground obviously implies, as well as gives birth to, a multidimensionality of meanings. What we have designated as a world of infinite possibilities, which is a metaphor for the world we experience as totally open-ended, addresses the same issue. Let me just repeat that again. What we have designated as a world of infinite possibilities, which is a metaphor for the world we experience as totally open-ended, addresses the same issue. Um, let me read a footnote here, if I may. For many people throughout the world, belief in a monotheistic God is their ground. Albert Einstein spoke of an experience of awe as his sensitivity to something beyond the human but not definable. Freud's 19th century positivistic education excluded his entertaining such a possibility. <coughs> Psychoanalytic findings have made us aware that any belief has to be examined by experience. An experience has to be constantly questioned in order to know what it is. A capacity for mystery and awe, in the sense that I am employing these terms, is consequent upon an examination of experience. It is not a substitute for it. Freud overemphasized rational analysis and downplayed mystery. Winnicott addressed this shortcoming when he noted for example, that, quote, we are poor indeed if we are merely sane. Isn't that a terrific sentence, okay? We are poor indeed if we are merely sane, end quote. And indicated that psychoanalysis has to recover from Freud's flight to sanity. Uh, English humor and very perceptive, okay? Psychoanalysis has to recover from Freud's flight to sanity. Okay. We do not need any conquistadors, conquistadors, excuse me, in the land of the unconscious. A capacity to experience mystery in our lives prepares us to hear more than what we can anticipate. Not only has psychoanalysis freed us from moralistic superego constraints, it is a new moment a new turn in human awareness. In its ability to address the repetitive patterns of one's past and resolve pernicious narcissism, which ultimately isolates human beings, 
it can be characterized as fostering spiritual enlightenment. It can serve as a meeting place, so to speak, out of which we can give birth to our world, just as the world gives birth to us. Footnote, uh, spontaneous footnote for you folks listening. I think psychoanalysis as an educational experience has suffered from pernicious narcissism. We've isolated ourselves in our institutes. We are not on, in the academia. We take uh, umbrage quite frequently at other disciplines that wish to have a dialogue with us or wish to have a, a, crit a critical uh, discussion with us. And that's something that we as a discipline and as a profession have to overcome. Okay? We're, we're, we're not isolates. Okay? And we are responsible to the larger intellectual community in which we live. Um, so let me read that last sentence again so I can continue. Okay? In its ability to address the repetitive patterns of one's past and resolve pernicious narcissism, which ultimately isolates human beings, it can be characterized as fostering spiritual enlightenment. It can serve, psychoanalysis that is, as a meeting place, so to speak, out of which we can give birth to our world just as the world gives birth to us. This is so since psychoanalysis universalizes individual experiences as it individualizes personal experiences. As, uh, excuse me, as it individualizes universal experiences, sorry. This is so since I, psychoanalysis universalizes individual experiences as it individualizes universal experiences. Consequently, we can say that each life is obviously our own and not our own. Not one's own, since each person is shaped by culture, molded by language, and formed by parents. Despite that perennial demiurge of the psyche, okay, has many a desire, that, demi that desire, excuse me, that perennial demiurge of the psyche has many incarnations, only one of which, transference, has psychoanalysis explored with focused intensity, that is, transference desire. If we are going to speak about the need to personally create the found world, then we have to complement transference desire with what we can call relational desire. By this I mean that area of human desire that captures our yearning for each other in ways other than the unrecognized or distorted demands of body or personal history. Relational desire is as internal and therefore as external as transference desire. Creating meaning from the tumble of facts that make up our lives brings us to a more basic and paradoxical position, however. That is, no discussion of personal meaning is possible, I believe, without addressing what the individual I means, the I with which we are singularly comfortable, as well as the I that is simultaneously elusive and mysterious. The I which is our own, the I which is not our own. When our sights are on that I with which we are comfortable, psychoanalytic insights have been particularly helpful. When our sights are on the I that is elusive and mysterious, we cross over to that land, uh, the land of mystery, poetry, and spirituality. In this, in this vein, okay, I am reminded of the poet Borges when he writes, quote, if in fact I am an I, end quote. An appreciation of poetry protects an analyst or a spiritual teacher from the fate of his words falling dead at his feet. To interpret unconscious contents and or processes is, as I have indicated, not only to name, but also to create the world we live in. That there are many worlds makes any commitment to one world 
less absolute and simultaneously less relative. That the psyche, in all its complexity, despite its dark manifestations, can be conceptualized as the Earth's self-awareness offers the possibility of freeing us from the narcissism of singularity, a narcissism that both psychoanalysis and spiritual traditions have, on occasion, contributed to. Neither psychoanalysis nor spiritual enlightenment is meant to promote unreflective self-awareness. Ideally, both should issue in a capacity for insight, civility, self-forgetfulness, vulnerability, and compassion. Both should issue in a capacity for insight, civility, self-forgetfulness, vulnerability, and compassion. It would help if we analysts could start with ourselves when we think of those qualities. Each of these routes can prepare us for a more communal experience of life, an experience where the distinction between what is psychoanalytic and what is spiritual need not be asked. That's really my thesis. Finally, we can say that if in order to know anything, we have to get beyond it, then to experience personal meaning, we have to paradoxically get beyond it. Erickson suggests as, much, as, suggests as much when he speaks of ego integration and of our need to pass our insights to the next generation quietly aware of the relativity of those insights. Quietly aware of the relativity of insights, those insights. Not holding on uh, with the conviction that we're passing on truth. Okay. Human subjectivity can be appreciated as singular as well as collective, internal, and simultaneously external. Each individual and culture is a momentary concretization within the generic background of a mist of infinite possibilities. That we create meaning recognizing these tensions suggests a pervasive everyday transcendence while it affirms personal individuality. As we create the world we live in, new worlds open to us. Thank you very much, and I look forward to any comments that you care to make.